All right, everyone, this is your first uh, major lecture for uh, English 1302. And in it, I'm going to talk a bit about this concept, what is literature? And we're literally looking at my lecture notes here. So I'm going to go over them. Uh, I'm going to stick pretty close to these notes, but add in a few things that I think uh, might be of interest. So you notice I also have some citations for you just in case you decide you want to uh, cite some items. I'm going to post these notes to uh, post these notes to uh, Blackboard for you. You see all the citations there. You can use these citations uh, when you get ready to write your own paper uh, if you want to cite something specific. So uh, there are some key ideas and notes that I want us to consider as we are discussing discussing this on the discussion board. Uh, the first one is how does literature benefit us? A lot of people uh, argue that literature does not have a direct benefit uh, for people and I think that that is very wrong and I don't say that just as somebody who has devoted his life to the study of literature I say that as somebody who has seen the practicality of literature. And if you've watched some of the videos that I've provided for you, uh, I think you will agree with me that literature does benefit us in surprising ways. Uh, so one of the other questions we need to be able to answer is, what does literature do for us that would take years, decades, millennia to do in real time? We want to answer the question of how does literature interact with the dominant value system? How does literature help us to be genuine? How should we use literature? And what, why does it preserve its prestige? This term literature, which you're going to define in your first essay, you're going to come up with a personal definition of what literature is. Uh, the term itself, though, we, we give it a level of prestige, even if we're not avid readers. When we hear the term literature, uh, there's a certain amount of awe that, and inspiration that's involved in that word. So contextually, literature you know, has really, in the last couple decades, become anything that's printed or anything that's visual. Uh, that you have to interpret, any sign or symbol that you have to interpret. So it's actually lost a lot of its prestige because the market is so flooded with it. I mean, uh, you can get a book for a penny on Amazon. So we're going to talk a bit about why literature is prestigious and why it's not. Uh, again, citations. Uh, you haven't read all these chapters you're only actually assigned to read the art of fiction, writing about literature, critical approaches to literature, and the Northrop Fry's Educated Imagination, uh, two chapters from that. And you'll also read uh, some selections from Ezra Pound's ABC of Reading. Uh, all of these will form sort of a foundation for your personal definition of literature. And I am leading you along to some of my own conclusions in the hopes that uh, you might actually start seeing literature as valuable. So key ideas and notes and questions to answer. Uh, one of the things in this class that I want to make very clear is that reading is absolutely essential to your success. Uh, if you skip a reading, you're not going to understand what I'm talking about. Uh, in fact, even if you read once, you might still have some issue understanding some of the concepts that I'm putting out there because I am teaching this class as almost an introductor, introductory course to literary studies. Uh, so you have the composition level where you're writing the essays and learning how to write essays, but I'm treating this also as an introduction to literary studies. So you have the literature level where you're learning about criticism and you're learning about all of these uh, strange ideas about texts and what texts are and how again they are useful for us. Um, one of the ways I'm going to evaluate whether you're reading 
are not reading is uh, your essays, uh, how your essays are written, how well they are written, as a matter of fact. Uh, are they, do they give specific quotes from the stories or the poems? Uh, do you follow instructions, that sort of thing? Uh, again, citing is also important. You're supposed to have this textbook, Writing Matters. You need to have it because you're going to be working on an assignment in it called Composition 3.0 that will help you with grammar and mechanics. Plus there's some other quizzes and tests uh, related to content that's in here. For example, there's a chapter on writing for the literature and the other humanities. It's uh, chapter 22 on page 432 that you'll need to read and that's part of the reading for this first module. Uh, so it's really important that you have this book. It's really important that you have this book as well. This is our main textbook and I prefer you have the 13th edition. Some of you have emailed me already and asked about older editions. Uh, that's fine, but you're going to be confused about some of the material. Uh, you have to use in-text citations and paraphrases correctly. Uh, that way, I know you're using writing matters, literature, or any supplemental resources I provide. Uh, so the key here is that you are reading, that you are focused on your reading, and that you realize your reading includes more than these pieces, these artifacts of literature, uh, like a short story or a poem, but they also include text on how to cite, uh, how to cite correctly. And whenever possible, I'll show you, as I do in these notes, how to cite correctly, uh, and also how to uh, these texts that help you put these writings in context. You know, it's all good and well to read a short story or a poem. But if you don't understand anything about the context of the piece, it makes the piece very difficult to follow. So that's going to be one of our goals this semester, is, is to understand things contextually. Uh, some critics would say that I'm not, that that's not right, that a text should stand for itself. And that's something that we can talk about and discuss in the discussion board, is how do these texts read differently when you add a historical lens to it or a Marxist lens to it, uh, these different literary uh, lenses that you will look at in your literature textbook. So the first thing I want you to think about since you are writing a definition essay, uh, the next thing I want you to think about is we define subjects by how we use them. Literature is a subject. It is an abstraction. Literature is evolving over time. So this idea that literature is not a static thing. Literature doesn't necessarily mean a big honkin' heavy textbook with the title literature on it. That's probably how most of you have interacted with it uh, in your life. But if you give me a second, I can show you some other types of texts that are literary. So you can see these things. You know, you have books like Saul Williams said the shotgun to the head, which you're actually going to listen to that poem later uh, in the semester. And they have all kinds of crazy things that they do with the text in that poem. Uh, the whole text is one single poem, and it's done a lot with visuals. There's a lot of visuals uh, and text ch ch shaping of text and uh, treating it almost like a film and how these cards, these each card could stand as a poem unto itself, even having interviews. Or you look at something like a collection of plays, uh, like Medea uh, here, Euripides Medea, and you see how thin this is. This is a piece of literature, a uh, piece of literature that's over 2,000 years old. So we still translate it and read it today. Uh, you can encounter literature in all sorts of things. And that's one of the main ideas I want to get across to you is that uh, literature is not simply a textbook called literature. Literature is huge. It's thriving. It's, it's more like the blob from the 1950s movies 
where it's it's this ever expanding immense of uh, Im immense monstrosity of ideas that totally engulfs anything it touches, and you get this concept from Fry. Uh, eventually, he he talks about that uh, literature doesn't literature doesn't reflect reflect uh, history or our culture, what literature does is consume it. That literature turns history into literature. Uh, the very act of literature coming into contact with something eventually corrupts it. It's, it's a corrupting influence. And that sounds very negative as well. Uh, very negative connotation of corrupting influence. But what I mean by that is simply that literature infects whatever it comes into contact with. Uh, so let's look at Northrop Fry for a little bit. You should have read some of this. Uh, my notes actually don't have that motive for metaphor chapter in it because I, I made these notes before putting the motive for metaphor chapter in there. So I do want to start actually with talking about that. So, but remember there's nothing in the print notes for it. So we're going to minimize the print notes for a minute. And I'm going to just bring up my screen so I can show you some pages here. Uh, increase the video so we can, uh, so I can see what uh, I'm doing, and you can see the pages when I uh, pull them up. So one of the things he starts talking about here on page 13, which is really page one, is he says, "What good?" You can kind of see it there. What good is the study of literature? Does it help us to think more clearly or feel more sensitively or live a better life than we could without it? What is the function of the teacher and scholar or of the person who calls himself, as I do, a literary critic? A literary critic. So you think about that. I want you to think about those questions. Because again, we define things based on how they're used. So in Motive for Metaphor, we get these questions about usefulness immediately. What good is the study of literature? Does it help us think more clearly or feel more sensitively or live a better life than we could without it? What is the function of the teacher and scholar or of a person who calls himself, as I do, a literary critic? Now, a lot of these questions were already answered for you in that those videos. You remember those videos from uh, the beginning of the course. They're uh, up here. Let's show those again so you can see them. It should be showing those to you. Let me minimize this. So you should see them now. Uh, there's what is literature for, which Actually, this would be a good time to watch this video. Let me see if it's up where it can be seen. Uh, it looks like it would be seen. I'm going to minimize my screen again. Okay. So let's watch this video quickly. We have a general sense that these sort of places are filled with things that are deeply important. But what exactly is literature good for? Why should we spend our time reading novels or poems when out there big things are going on? Let's have a think about some of the ways that literature benefits us. Of course, it looks like it's wasting time, but literature is ultimately the greatest time saver because it gives us access to a range of emotions and events that it would take you years, decades, millennia to try to experience directly. Literature is the greatest reality simulator, a machine that puts you through infinitely more situations than you could ever directly witness. It lets you, safely, that's crucial, see what it's like to get divorced or kill someone and feel remorseful or chuck in your job and take off to the desert or make a terrible mistake while leading your country. It lets you speed up time in order to see the arc of a life from childhood to old age. It gives you the keys to the palace and to countless bedrooms so you can assess your life in relation to that of others. 
It introduces you to fascinating people. A Roman general, an 11th century French princess, a Russian upper class mother just embarking on an affair. It takes you across continents and centuries. Literature cures you of provincialism and at almost no cost turns us into citizens of the world. Literature performs the basic magic of showing us what things look like from someone else's point of view. It allows us to consider the consequences of our actions on others in a way we otherwise wouldn't. And it shows us examples of kindly, generous, sympathetic people. Literature typically stands opposed to the dominant value system, the one that rewards money and power. Writers are on the other side. They make us sympathetic to ideas and feelings that are of deep importance, but that can't afford airtime in a commercialized, status conscious and cynical world. We're weirder than we're allowed to admit. We often can't say what's really on our minds. But in books, we find descriptions of who we genuinely are and what events are actually like, described with an honesty quite different from what ordinary conversation allows for. In the best books, it's as if the writer knows us better than we know ourselves. They find the words to describe the fragile, weird, special experiences of our inner lives. The light on a summer morning, the anxiety we felt at the gathering, the sensations of a first kiss, the envy when a friend told us of their new business, the longing we experienced in the train, looking at the profile of another passenger we never dared to speak to. Writers open our hearts and minds and give us maps to our own selves so that we can travel in them more reliably and with less of a feeling of paranoia and persecution. As the writer Emerson remarked, in the works of great writers, we find our own neglected thoughts. Literature is a corrective to the superficiality and compromises of friendship. Books are our true friends, always to hand, never too busy, giving us unvarnished accounts of what things are really like. All of our lives, one of our greatest fears is of failing, of messing up, of becoming, as the tabloids put it, a loser. <laughs> Every day, the media takes us into stories of failure. Interestingly, a lot of literature is also about failure. In one way or another, a great many novels, plays, poems are about people who messed up, people who slept with mum by mistake, or who let down their partner, or who died after running up some debts on shopping sprees. If the media got to them, they'd make mincemeat out of them. But great books don't judge as harshly or as one-dimensionally as the media. They evoke pity for the hero and fear for ourselves based on a new sense of how near we all are to destroying our own lives. But if literature can really do all these things, we might need to treat it a bit differently to the way we do now. We tend to treat it as a distraction, an entertainment, something for the beach. But it's far more than that. It's really therapy in the broad sense. We should learn to treat it as doctors treat their medicines, mm. something we prescribe in response to a range of ailments and classify according to the problems it might best be suited to addressing. Literature deserves its prestige for one reason above all others, because it's a tool to help us live and die with a little bit more wisdom, goodness and sanity. So that's probably the uh, second time that you've watched it, if you've been following directions and working in order uh, but now it's it's more contextual with these notes so when we look at these notes and we ask what reality does literature have uh, and what purpose does literature have uh, this is an important question for our conversation because we often judge a thing's merit by its reality what this means is we often devalue things that do not have an immediate and tangible use Think of it this way, is it better to sit and dream about a house or is it better to work and save for a house? In our culture, we value the person who works, who saves. The dreamer is often devalued in our society. We want a thing to be practical versus poetic. So we really have this drive toward practicality, particularly in American culture. And that makes literature at times a challenge uh, for us to interact with because literature really is about dreaming or imagining a, ourselves in different roles or putting ourselves in these new positions of, of reality, seeing the world from uh, another set of eyes. It's, it's really about experience, uh, experiences that you 
do not get to have otherwise. And that's a challenge, and it's scary because often we don't want to be confronted with the issues that a piece of literature put before us. Uh, or we don't quite understand because our, our background leaves us, uh, let's say, less than open-minded. You know, uh, literature does require a measure of open-mindedness that some people just are not willing to, to have. Uh, I beg of you that this semester you really work on open-mindedness to ideas uh, so that the literature can be effective for you. So one of the things Fry does is he points to the unreality of characters in great works of literature. It is their unreality that makes them useful. Fry argues for this idea. If you have not read the Iliad, which Achilles appears, you may want to rent Troy, which is a, count, a contemporary adaptation that removes all the interplay of the mythological deities in the text. Troy is uh, basically the Iliad without all the magic and gods being involved and immortality, but it still tells the story of Achilles, uh, Achilles as this heroic figure. Now, what Fry talks about is how if Achilles really existed, he existed in such a way that was is nothing like he appears in the Iliad or any of the adaptations of the Iliad that have followed. Uh, his existence was probably very, very different, uh, his reality. And yet the reason Achilles exists now in stories is he has been turned into something mythological. He's been turned into a symbol uh, of what all men strive to be in some ways rather than what we really are. And so we need that fantasy. And literature can be that fantasy for us. It can be entertainment in that sense. But the entertainment is more meaningful than, uh, than you know, just going and seeing a movie. Uh, there, there's a whole level of, at times, even the entertainment has a lesson embedded in it. And I, I don't like using the word lesson because, frankly, uh, as a creative writer, I don't, when I write a poem, I don't think about a lesson. I'm not thinking about teaching my reader anything. I'm thinking about capturing a moment of time, a moment of beauty, or a moment of tragedy, and, and through that experience, trying to share the, the sublime experience uh, with, the, with the reader. But um, a lot of writing is what they call didactic. A lot of literature is what they call didactic, and it does have a message, and it does have a lesson for us. And we usually learn that lesson through having characters that are less like us rather than more like us. So one of the quotes that I have here in the notes is, The poet's job is not to tell you what happened, but what happens. Not what did take place, but what kind of thing always takes place. And I think this is an important quote to remember, Fry's quote there, because... Uh, one of the things that literature really pushes for is uh, its immortality. You know, Shakespeare and all of his sonnets is constantly talking about the immortality of uh, the people he's writing about, how they'll live forever because of his writing. Well, uh, that may be true. They may live forever because of his writing. Uh, Lord knows there's enough editions of Shakespeare's sonnets out there that it's, it's probably the case. But that's not the uh, end of it, all right? Uh, we have to think about this in the way that a critic thinks about it, that the poet or the writer uh, has a responsibility to tell a story or uh, to capture a moment that transcends everyday life. And that's really difficult to uh, do. So next time you think about writing a poem in 15 minutes, think about that. Think about the, the truth that the poet must uh, write something that transcends time, uh, the kind of thing that always takes place, must be in the poem itself. Uh, he talks a bit 
Fry talks a bit about Aristotle and his idea of the universal event. I give you some background links here for more information about Aristotle. Uh, it's good foundational stuff that you can cite to help you talk a bit more about literature. Uh, here's some more information on Achilles. Now, one of the ways that we know a text is literature versus lowercase literature, just like a pamphlet or something, is literature speaks to the universal elements of human experience and desire. So we have characters in a literary text that uh, speak to uh, this experience of and desire to be uh, gods or to be in control of our lives or to do these things that uh, we cannot do in real life. And that's one of the things that separates literature from lowercase literature is, is it, it's so hard to put this into words, it embodies our desires. It's like uh, Fry says, nobody cares now about the historical Achilles, Achilles if there ever was one. But the mythical Achilles reflects a part of our own lives. This correspondence of the natural and the human is one of the things that the word symbol means. So we can say that whenever a writer uses an image or object from the world around him, he's made it a symbol. So literature is also very symbolic. Uh, what this means is in a text, you'll read a phrase like uh, from Saul Williams said the shotgun uh, to the head you'll read something like you blame your thoughts on Magdalene and let Bostonians wash your feet, your sidewalks scuff your wingtips, your angels fly through barrels, monkeys laugh at them. So all these things become symbols in the text. The Magdalene is from Christian uh, history, Bostonians, the city of Boston, the image of having his feet washed, which is also from Christian uh, na narratives, uh, scuffing the wingtips, that sort of thing. Angels fly through barrels, monkeys laugh at them. Uh, all of that, the idea of monkeys laughing at humans, uh, it all becomes symbolic. So literature uses symbols. Literature translates abstract ideas into concrete images and situations. Abstract ideas are concepts that have no real-world reference. For example, God has no physical presence in the world as far as we can tell. Uh, that means that God has no weight. He has no uh, physicality. There's nothing to measure. Because there's nothing to measure, then he is a concept. Uh, so literatures have created concrete images and situations that symbolize the concept of God for readers and listeners since the earliest storytellers set around a campfire. God is an abstraction, a literary deity, Allah, Buddha, Elohim, Jehovah, Jesus, Zeus, et al. They've existed in almost every culture uh, where they've tried to make God a man uh, and tried to turn an abstract concept into a concrete concept. Um, so the idea is each of these characters is a concrete manifestation of the abstraction. These figure, figures act as symbols of the divine and in doing so are granted the title and history of God. Uh, something that might be a little less offensive is if you think of the term love. Love is a, an abstraction as well. Love is an abstraction. People write love stories. Boy meets girl, girl meets boy. Boy who thinks he is a girl meets girl who thinks she is a boy. Alien meets alien. These situations are concrete, but they only become symbol when placed in the context of literature as an attempt to give an abstraction like love concrete qualities like reality has. So in reality, you know, love is a feeling, something we think about, but everybody feels that emotion differently. And so uh, there's no one definition of it that really works. But when it's put into a story and it becomes part of the action, Love then becomes one of the concepts that frame the story, and it moves from abstraction to concreteness. Uh, that's one of the 
important aspects about literature to think about. So as you're reading, one of the things are, I, I don't think I have a ton more of notes here. Actually, I do have quite a lot more notes. But uh, one of the things you need to think about, particularly when you're reading Northrop Fry, is that you're going to encounter a lot of vocabulary terms, particularly this semester, that you might not be familiar with. Go ahead and look those up. Use a dictionary and keep a running list of these vocabulary terms because they're going to repeat. They're going to uh, change definition a little bit as they go. So make sure you keep track of those notes uh, and, and keep track of those terms. So I'm going to introduce another term now. Allegory. A lot of stories are allegorical. What that means is uh, we use a deliberate use of symbol to illustrate abstract ideas. So, you know, instead of a, the character himself becomes hatred and is named hatred, uh, Pilgrim's Progress is an old story that uh, is notorious for this. Um, Spencer's Fairy Queen was notorious for this, where characters would actually be the embodiment of certain sins or certain ideas. And we can think of almost all literature as allegorical in a sense, uh, but in, in contemporary literature they've really tried to move away from that. Uh, having said that though, literature by its nature is also elusive, and this refers to the idea of illusions. All literature is influenced or in conversation with other literature. So almost all the texts that you interact with are aware of texts that came in the past uh, that uh, in some way shaped and defined them. Writers read a lot. One of the best ways to become a good writer is to read a lot. Uh, because we read a lot, uh, we have a lot of things we can allude to, a lot of things we can reference, and other writers pick up on those references and readers do as well. All literature is influenced on conversation with other literature. That's a key point that you need to think about moving forward with your definition. Uh, literature tends to be very elusive in the central theme, uh, themes in literature. So I see some typos here. Literature tends to be very elusive in the central themes in literature, the Greek and Roman classics, the Bible, Shakespeare, and Milton are echoed over and over again. So there's these texts that uh, we see repeated throughout um, our study of literature. If you wish to study literature, you would do well to read the King James Bible, the complete works of William Shakespeare, including the sonnets, Robert Graves, the Greek myths 1 and 2, Milton's Paradise Lost, and Aristotle's Poetics. Those five texts are pretty much foundational to uh, understanding uh, most literature fully. Uh, literature consists of canons. Uh, the list I've given in this lecture is a canon, a group of texts that I believe are necessary for a reader to fully engage in a study. There are different canons in literary studies, so some other critics and teachers might say, oh, you should have John Donne in that list, or you should have Aphra Ben in that list, you know. Uh, these lists change depending on who you talk to. But these are key texts that I know uh, would reflect what Northrop Fry talks about uh, in his writing. One of the ideas that's very important to your definition that I hope you don't leave behind is this idea that in literature you don't just read one poem or novel after another but enter into a complete world of which every work of literature forms a part. So said the shotgun to the head is influenced by a ton of other literatures and they all come into play with the uh, they all come into play with uh, the text itself. So when you read something, like you remember that, that uh, thing about the Magdalene and washing the feet, that's referencing the Bible. And we find references to scripture uh, in all kinds of unexpected places. That's one of the 
keys to literature. It, it, it forms uh, this really distinct canon. Uh, we relate the poems and plays and novels we read and see not to the men who wrote them, nor even directly to ourselves. We relate them to each other. Literature is a world that we try to build up and enter at the same time. So some questions that you should be typing or thinking about in the discussion board is how then does Fry define literature at this point? Literature deals with the universal aspects of human nature. Literature takes real objects and makes them symbols. Literature is elusive. It is best understood in the context of other literature. So you may be asking now the big question, how can we use it? One of the most obvious uses, I think, is its encouragement of tolerance. Literature actually forces us to be more tolerant over time. Uh, you've got this statement here, literature does not reflect life, but it does, doesn't escape or withdraw from life either. It swallows it. And this is an, an important quote uh, from Fry, probably the most important quote in the whole lecture. Uh, important concept to remember. Literature then relies on all the all-engulfing capabilities of the imagination. It's the imagination itself that really drives literature. So Ezra Pound takes all those concepts and he, and he sort of, uh, and he predates Fry, but he sort of twists them just a little bit to focus more on this idea of language that's charged with meaning literature as language that's charged with meaning. So what this means is that language is paramount, the main focus, when one is attempting to classify text as literature. Literature can be defined by its uses. We want language that moves us. In order to move us, it must be charged with meaning. There are many ways to charge language with meaning. You can repeat words, syllables, phrases, sounds, and that creates sort of a charge. You can put unusual words together, words that don't normally match up together. You can use sounds and words to mimic the actions and emotions of speakers, characters, and a tale. You can change the shape, font, and size of the text. Again, like I said, the shotgun to the head does. Uh, and then there's this sort of meta-awareness in literature. Literature is aware of itself as literature. Uh, and that's tied up in language. And another thing Pound says is this idea of literature is news that stays news. So it's always relevant. This, No matter how old it is, a literary work is still relevant to today. Uh, relevance changes over time, and literature does not exist in the vacuum, which is the same concept. Uh, Fry talks about that all literature connects uh, to previous literature. So I have some concluding ideas here. I'm going to leave those for you all to look at, and there's some space on this for you to take your notes. I'm going to save this, and I'm actually going to upload it with uh, into this module. For you all. And I'm also going to load this video over to YouTube, and uh, you'll have it for your access to study uh, with. You can expect weekly lectures uh, for the online class that will appear in the modules. Uh, some weeks, of course, they'll be longer than others. This is a really long lecture because it's uh, some of the most fundamental ideas I want you to grasp. Uh, I think the next lecture will deal more with the research project, and we'll talk a bit more about what that is and how that functions. So I am going to sign off. I hope this lecture was interesting. Please uh, participate in the What is Literature Q&A, and uh, I look forward to